What I'm discussing today is a sensitive topic. Many people resist all conversation entirely out of fear and discomfort, regardless of going headfirst into it with you today. This topic needs factual knowledge before any opinions can be brought to the table. My goal today is to educate you before opinions are formed about lethal injections, a way to kill criminals with much more elegance than chopping their heads off or quartering. And for those of you who don't know what quartering is, use Google. Sensitive eyes beware. Today, we as a human society have evolved beyond these barbaric methods of execution to a scientifically efficient method of lethal injection. Let's begin by discussing exactly what is in a lethal injection. Lethal injection actually has three separate injections, each with a different purpose. The first injection is sodium thiopental, a general anesthetic used to render someone unconscious. It has the chemical formula of C11H17N2NaO2S, or in layman's terms, 11 carbon atoms, 17 hydrogen, 2 nitrogen, 1 sodium, 2 oxygen, and 1 sulfur. In order for all these elements to combine to form the whole molecule, the elements need to bond. Let's review the two main types of bonds, ionic and covalent. Ionic bonding occurs between metals and nonmetals, and in this bond, a nonmetal gains electrons from the metal, meaning that the octet law has been satisfied. This means that each atom has a full outer valence shell. In this example, chlorine takes an electron from sodium. Sodium thiopental is one such bond, and also has two covalently bonded units, but we have to know about covalent bonds first. Covalent bonds occur between two nonmetals, and here the electrons are shared. This is so both elements can satisfy the octet rule and have a full outer valence shell. A covalently bonded unit is a group of elements all bonded together covalently. In methane, the four hydrogens each share two electrons with the one carbon, so the octet rule is satisfied for each atom. In sodium thiopental, two such units exist. You see the unit of 2CH2, CH3, and CH, along with the unit of CH3 and CH2. In the image, each line represents a covalent bond. Furthermore, sodium thiopental has three hydrogen bonds, which are attractions that occur between a proton, called a hydrogen ion, and an atom that has high electronegativity, such as oxygen. The positive hydrogen is attracted to the negative oxygen. Hydrogen bond is not actually a bond, but only an attraction. They're weaker than both covalent and ionic bonds. The second chemical injected is pancuronium bromide. Pancuronium bromide has a chemical formula of C35H60Br2N2O4, or 35 carbon atom 60 hydrogen, 2 bromine, 2 nitrogen, and 4 oxygen. This chemical has three covalently bonded units, one with OCCH3, one with H3CCO, and one with NCH3 on the right of the image, meaning that there are three separate sections of covalently bonded atoms, all covalently bonded together. It is highly toxic because it can cause diaphragmatic paralysis, something we will discuss later. The last chemical injected is potassium chloride. Its chemical formula is KCl, meaning just one potassium atom and one chlorine atom per molecule. Rather than being bonded covalently, it has an ionic bond. Potassium atom gives up an electron to the chlorine, as seen on the screen now. This is how both atoms have the octet rule satisfied. Potassium chloride is also known to cause cardiac arrest, something we will cover in just a few minutes. But before we begin talking about how the chemicals take effect in the body, let's discuss how they actually enter the convicted in the first place. All injections are administered via IV attached to a syringe. The reason a syringe is able to inject the fluid is due to a physics concept called Boyle's Law. It states that P1V1 equals P2V2, meaning the product of the pressures and the volumes of two different systems will always be equal with constant temperatures. When the syringe is pulled back, like on the left of the screen, pressure will decrease and a negative pressure space is created. Boyle's Law states that if pressure decreases, the volume will increase, so the molecules of the chemical that are being injected will expand. However, the amount of liquid does not change. Conversely, when the syringe is pushed down, the pressure increases and causes the volume of the fluid to rapidly decrease, pushing it into the body. It enters the vein through the tip of the needle due to the diffusion. The fluid moves from a higher to a lower concentration, a form of passive transport, meaning that the fluid moves without energy from high to low concentration through a semi-permeable membrane, as shown now. Now let's go over the biological effects. Sodium thiopental works as a general anesthetic that causes unconsciousness. When someone is under anesthetics, he or she needs a mask for breathing. The mask is required because respiratory muscles relax, meaning that the airways are not able to be opened to breathe. First, let's examine how muscles relax. A muscle is made up of a large content of parallel muscle fibers. Each fiber is a very long cell with several nuclei. Each fiber has several myofibrils, and each myofibril has several smaller units called sarcomeres. The sarcomere is where the muscle contraction occurs and is made up of two filaments, actin and myosin. The actin in red on the screen is a thin filament that causes the muscles to contract when it slides past the myosin, the thicker filament in blue. The sarcomere is shortened. The lengths of the actin and myosin are unchanged. The actin slides past the myosin when ATP, a form of chemical energy, binds to myosin, causing the myosin head to be released from an actin filament. The ATP then breaks down when one of ATP's three phosphates is separated and releases energy. This causes tropomyosin, a protein that blocks relaxed myosin from going to the second binding site to move, so the myosin head can move and bind to the different actin binding sites. This causes the actin filament to slide forward and the muscle to contract. With anesthesia and pancuronium bromide, there is a blockage at the second binding spot so the myosin cannot reattach to the actin. 
This means that the muscle cannot contract in the airways will be blocked. However, this is not expected to cause death, so the pancuronium bromide is then injected. Pancuronium bromide causes death by asphyxiation because it causes the diaphragm to paralyze. The diaphragm is a respiratory muscle that is key for breathing. Humans use a form of breathing called negative pressure breathing, meaning that we don't actually inhale the air. It is due to Boyle's Law. Remember, Boyle's Law states that P1V1 equals P2V2. So when the diaphragm moves downward, its volume decreases and its pressure increases. The diaphragm's contraction allows for the chest cavity to expand, so the lung's volume increases. By Boyle's Law, the lung's pressure will decrease, causing oxygen to move into the lungs. This is because the oxygen gas will move from a higher area of pressure, the air around us, to an area of lower pressure, the lungs. When the diaphragm relaxes, the opposite happens and the carbon dioxide, the waste product, moves out from a higher pressure to a lower pressure in the atmosphere around us. However, pancuronium bromide causes the diaphragm to paralyze. The diaphragm is a muscle and paralyzes for the same reason as the sodium thiopental causes the rest of the respiratory muscles to paralyze. Blockage in the second actin binding site, causing asphyxiation and death. Potassium chloride is then injected and causes cardiac arrest due to arrhythmias, but to understand that we have to discuss the heart. The heart has four chambers, two atria, two ventricles. An oxidized blood starts in the right atrium, then the right ventricle, then the pulmonary circuit. The pulmonary circuit sends the blood to the lungs, where it is reoxidized and goes back to the heart. The blood then flows to the left atrium, then left ventricle, then the systemic circuit. The systemic circuit delivers oxygen to all organs via blood. The now unoxidized blood returns to the heart and the process starts over again. What KCL does is bind the heart and cause arrhythmias. The excess KCL will cause one of the atria or ventricles to speed up or slow down. This is an arrhythmia and is also known as ventricular or atrial fibrillation. What happens with atrial ventricular fibrillation is the blood pools up and clots. This causes cardiac arrest because the heart stops working and this is deadly. By now, I hope that everyone watching has a full understanding of how a lethal injection works and the scientific facts behind it. I intentionally left out any political opinions. Please feel free to form your own at this point because now you have the facts. Thank you for watching. Have a great day. Any questions can be emailed at the address on the screen. Thank you.